When it comes to lighting your scene, does your workflow include going through multiple HDRs and hoping that one of them will uh, fit your needs? If yes, then this video is for you. Today, we're going to try to decipher lighting. Lighting in 3D, even a decade ago, was a little bit tricky because physically accurate renderers weren't so widespread. But nowadays, we have a wealth of renderers that can mimic the real world quite accurately. Aside from the fact that uh, this allows us to set up our scenes very easily, it also has one more benefit. We can copy exactly what photographers are doing in the real world and apply it to our 3D scenes. To take advantage of uh, that in cinema, we need to set up our scene with uh, reflectance-based materials. If you don't know how to do that, you can check the video in the top right corner. In order for us to improve our lighting skills, we need to first understand how light works. In the real world, we have two main components affecting how the light will be rendered in a photograph. The first component is the size of the light source, and the second one is the camera settings. The intensity of the light comes in play only in relation to other light sources in our scene. For example, we want one side of our object to be lit more than the other side. Now let's see how all of these components work together. We're going to use a really basic example. Here we have our setup, a light source with a dimmer that allows us to control the intensity of the light, our camera, and our simple still life here. For the camera to get the right exposure, we need to adjust two settings, aperture and shutter speed. Anything above zero means that the image will be overexposed, and anything below zero means that the image is underexposed. If, for example, we have strong lights, we need to adjust the camera settings in order to avoid overexposing our image. What we gather from all this is that the intensity of the light doesn't really matter. We will always get the same image whether the light is on low or high intensity, because the camera or the photographer will compensate for it by adjusting the aperture and shutter speed in order to get a correctly exposed image. Let's see that in practice. We will take two pictures. One will have the light on its maximum intensity and the other one with the light on minimum. I have the camera set on aperture priority, so I control the aperture, which is 2.8, and then the camera will increase or decrease the shutter speed in order to expose the image correctly. Let's first set the light on the maximum intensity and take a picture. The camera figured out that it needs 1 13th for a correct exposure. Now let's uh, reduce the intensity of the light all the way down and take another picture. As you can see now, the camera calculated that it needs to adjust the shutter speed to 3.2 to get the right exposure. We can easily see that the images look the same. The intensity of the light was of no consequence because the camera compensated for the extra brightness by adjusting the shutter speed. The intensity of the light would come in play if we use the same camera settings in both pictures. So if we first measured the image with a light set on low intensity and use those same settings for the image with a high intensity, we would get an overexposed image. Now that we know that light intensity doesn't matter, how do we control the shadows and how the light will render the image? That key ingredient is the size of our light. A small light relative to the distance from the object will give us hard shadows. A big light with the exact same intensity as the small one will give us soft shadows. This is essentially what photographers are doing when they're using umbrellas or soft boxes. They are taking a small light and creating a bigger one out of it by adding this big white surface in front. Let's test this out. We're going to use the same setup as before. Let's first snap a picture and see again how our scene looks like. As you can see, the shadows are well defined and quite dark. Now let's introduce a diffuser in front of the light. What we're essentially doing now is that we're increasing the size of the light and bringing it closer to a subject. 
Let's take a picture. Now the shadows are softer and not as dark. Even when using the diffuser, we can get soft or hard shadows. The closer we move the diffuser to the light, the harder the shadows will get, because we're essentially reducing the size of the light in relation to the subject of our picture. Even if we don't have a diffuser, we can still get soft shadows just by moving the light closer to the subject. Now let's see if we can apply the same principles in 3D. What I'm going to show you is a setup I don't suggest using because it's computationally intensive, but it will recreate the same setup as in real life. We can achieve the same result much easier, so don't really bother trying to use this in your scenes. I will show you how to do it in a simpler and faster way in a little bit. So here we have a pretty basic setup. We have our studio background, our 3D model, which is going to be the main subject of the image, and finally our light and a half of a sphere which will act as an umbrella. By the way, the 3D model is a scanned head by the guys from 1024 and you can also download it from the link you will find in the description below. It's a nicely detailed head and it will work great for our light tests. Since we're only concentrating on the effect of lights and not materials, I won't bother creating complicated subsurface scattering materials. That would add even more variables to our tests. So the material for the head and the studio background will be a really basic diffuse material. Our virtual umbrella works by having a backlight shader applied to it. So it grabs whatever light source is behind it. Again, this setup is just to show you how you can basically get the same effect as in the real world. In order for the backlight shader to work, we need a light object. So a geometry light in this case will not work. But since I want to have the light object behave the same way as a geometry light would, I adjusted the settings a little bit. This is how the light object is set up. This will mirror exactly how a geometry light with a 20 cm radius would operate if we use the same light intensity. So if we wanted to replace the light object with a polygonal light later on, we would get the exact same result. Let's try first a render without the umbrella, and only this one light here. The light source is quite far from the subject, so we should be getting some hard shadows. Let's do a render to see what will happen. Sure enough, we get the hard shadows as we expected. Now let's introduce the umbrella. We should be getting a similar result as in the real world. So the umbrella should give us soft and less dark shadows. Again, our assumption was correct. Disregard the extra uh, render noise. This has to do with the backlight shader and the way this scene is effectively rendered now. We can get rid of it by increasing the blurriness subdivisions in the render settings, but there's no reason to bother with that. Now, coming back to the umbrella render. If you notice, we didn't change the intensity of the light at all. The only thing we did was to basically increase the size of our light source. So if we decrease the size of the light source relative to the subject by just moving it farther from the subject, our shadows will start getting harder and darker again, as they did in real life. And that's basically what you need to remember. Small light means hard shadows, big light means soft shadows. Moving the light up or down will affect how long the shadows will be. The closer the light is to the ground, the longer the shadows will be. The higher the light is compared to the ground, the shorter the shadows will be. Now let's go back to the head example and see how we can reproduce the umbrella setup but without all the long render times. Since we won't use the backlight shader anymore, I will just switch to a geometry light. We can still use the normal light, but I just like things to be as simple as possible, so I don't want to really deal with the light object. I already have a sphere here, so I will just enable it and disable both the light and the umbrella. If you remember, the reason we added the umbrella was to increase the size of the light. So if we want to get softer shadows, we can do just that. So let's do 84 for the radius. 
as you can see now, our image got much brighter. And I didn't change the light intensity at all. Why is that? If you remember from a real world example, that is because we haven't compensated for the correct exposure. So now, if we go to our camera here, we see that we're not using the exposure controls at all. So Cinema basically uses a generic camera with the same settings as when the light source was small. So let's enable the exposure option here and adjust the shutter speed accordingly. I already know what the correct value is, so I'll just type it out. Now our exposure is the same as before, and if I bring both renders here to compare, the shadows are much softer. Now let's say we don't want to have the light spill on the background. Again, all we need to do is copy what photographers are doing in real life. So we can just add a black card to block the light from bouncing onto our studio backdrop. This is how the image looks like without the card, and this is how it looks with the card. Now the last thing we need to know is how to control the intensity of our shadows. If for example we want to make the shadows lighter on the right side, we can just add a bounce card as real photographers would do. So all we need to do is just create a plane, rotate it a little bit to get the optimum angle, and just add a white diffuse material. So now we maintain the shadows, which are important to create some nice definition for the subject, but they're not as dark as before. And by adjusting basically the color of the bounce card or the distance from the subject, we can control how dark or light our shadows will be. Since we can apply in 3D the same logic as in the real world, that means we can duplicate basically everything photographers are doing which in turn allows for more realism in our renders. Now that we know that, let's try to copy a real-world example. Here I have a really nice photo with just two glasses, and we also happen to have the real-world setup. You can find these images on the very nice uh, article Laia Gerlach, uh, sorry for butchering your name, wrote over at DIYphotography.net. I'll have the link in the description below. So here, we can see that the setup is really simple. They're using a regular backdrop and a speed light with a color gel. And that's about it. So here I've built the equivalent setup in 3D. Let me go outside of the camera and see how that setup looks like. I basically tried to reproduce the real world as a setup as close as possible. One thing to keep in mind is that you should try to use real units in your scenes. So try not to have glasses that are 2 meters high or a light that is 10 meters wide. Here for example my light has a size of 6 uh, centimeters. What I thought the dimensions of the speed light uh, would be. This will make things much easier to reproduce. So here, as in the real world uh, setup, my light is quite close to the background and is also the only light source in my scene. So I disabled auto light in the render preferences. Here are the settings I used for the light. As you can see my light is colored blue since in the picture they also use a blue gel in front of the light. The glasses are also close to the background which will help define some areas in the glass. Now let's see how this thing renders. I didn't bother modeling the exact same glasses so I'm just using the same piece of glass turned upside down. But every little thing counts if you want to create a compelling image. So this is how the render looks like. And uh, here's the render with the real world image side by side. Try it out yourself and see how close you can get to the real world image. It's a really nice and fun exercise. Before we close this video, I would just like to give you some small tips when lighting. The first one is to try to avoid having uh, lighting coming right from in front of the subject. It will create an image that looks very flat and doesn't allow the form of the object to show through. The second one would be to try to use different lenses to frame your scene. Photographers are not using just one lens. Depending on the subject, they will go from a really long lens to really wide lens. Portraits, for example, are shot with lenses anywhere around 70 to 100 millimeters. Landscapes on the other side are on the exact opposite. So we would see lenses around 14 to 24 millimeters. And finally, 
When trying to set up a studio type of shot, try to avoid putting your subject close to the background. If you do, then you will start getting unwanted shadows from the subject and you will also have problems separating it uh, from the background. So it'll be more difficult to darken the background, for example, or just light it separately from the subject. We need to have our uh, subject quite far away from the background in order to achieve those effects. And that's about it for this video. Try out yourself imitating real-world uh, setups and see how far you can go with them. You're just a Google search away from uh, finding all sorts of setups for different use cases. I think you'll have plenty of fun trying things out. And uh, that's it. If you found the video helpful, consider subscribing to the channel, and I'll see you on the next one.